Now, many historians think that this is the end of our professional activities when we have uh, brought evidence into the concepts of historical understanding. The next picture. But this is a mistake. There is something additionally to be brought about. You must write it. You must give it a form. And the form, we can call it historiography. Well, that is, of course, in the academic field, always these written books, a thesis and uh, I don't know what. But there are other forms. But let me just uh, concentrate on writing down. And this is very important. All of you who have ever written an essay, a paper in historical studies, know what I say when I say the cognition process even goes on when we write it down. We think we have it in our mind, and then we say, OK, I write it down. And then you will find out, oh, writing down is something very specific. It brings new elements into the sense generation. And this is very important. And here we have the main interesting point of metahistory today. Here's a place for Hayden White to tell the historians what oh, you are producing are narrative texts. It's like literature. And he never mentioned a word about research and interpretation and so on. But on the other hand, that is a very important issue. In the 19th century, where the historians have concentrated on method, on method they had, didn't say very much about historiography. Today, it's just the other way around. In meta-history, people speak about texts, narratives, and forget about method and research. And to give you an example, what this specific element of writing, of forming a historical narrative is about, let's look what somebody does who has just finished research and is now beginning to write it down. Next picture. First of all, you say, oh my goodness, now I have to write. And then you see, you are looking for the great formulation. Let me add a remark. The most interesting, or one of the most interesting issues of meta-history today is the interrelationship between interpretation and representation. Interpretation is a procedure of research. Representation is an, in, uh, an issue of writing down. Today, the people say either interpretation or representation. And the most known, the most progressive people in meta-history, like Frank Ankersmith, Hayden White, and others say, there is no interpretation. There is only representation. Or, Representation is interpretation. Well, that is not wrong, but they forget that interpretation has some elements of methodical rationality which is completely forgotten. On the other hand, those people, for instance, like Jürgen Kocker and others, who concentrate on the method of interpretation and thinking about the role of theories here, they can't say very much about representation. Both are interrelated, and at the same time, they are different. Now, please, the next great work in Brazilian meta-history will be a book about the relationship between interpretation and representation, and you can be sure it immediately be translated into English. Now, in my next step of argumentation, I will refer to the same issue, but in a different perspective. I have presented you the process of historical sense generation as something monological. If there were a kind of a world spirit called the historian doing that. But in fact, how does this sense generation take place? always in a communication between people, historians and the audience and uh, the representatives of public life and so on and so on. 
It's a communicative process. One mode of communication is essential for historical science, namely argumentation. But there is much more in the business of historical sense generation, even done by the professional historians, than argumentation. And I want to show you the different modes of communication which take place in the real process of sense generation by historians in the context of their social, political, and cultural life. The communication which brings about historical meaning and sense into human life starts with the discourse of symbolization. This is not an issue only for professional historians. It is much, much deeper. It is a, presupp a cultural presupposition for the professional historians. Here, of course, certain strategies of language takes place. You must find symbols, metaphors, to characterize the temporal change you want to come to terms with. Such a metaphor, for instance, is a metaphor progress. Hayden White has published very interesting proposals to understand the discourse of symbolization. He says the main principles in this discourse of symbolizations are tropes. He keeps them from uh, the, the classical rhetoric. It is an open question whether these tropes are specific specific and meet the distinctive nature of the temporal change with it, the issue of historical sense generation. But in any case, here we have the basic communication which is in a way in this abstract scheme the starting point of bringing about sense and meaningful historical knowledge. So, Based on this discourse of symbolization, another discourse takes place, and that is the next step in this dynamics of historical sense generation, next picture, that is the strategy of cognition. This leads into the field of solid knowledge generation. And here, metaphors are no longer the essentials. Metaphors have to be changed into concepts. This is completely forgotten in the humanities. Metaphors is necessary, are necessary, but doing our jobs as academics, we have to give the metaphor a theoretical or a conceptual form, and then we do our business as scientists. So then the next layer, if you like, or the next section in communicating historical sense generation is, and that is the next picture, the strategy of aesthetics. That is a completely different communication. Leopold von Ranke, the famous uh, German um, historian of the 19th century, once said, history is a synthesis of science and art. Science, he said, is method. Art means the ability of making the past living in the present. And that is what has to be brought about in the strategy of aesthetics. And I give you a nice example what it means by the cartoonist Perzhovsky. How the past comes back to life in the present by a successful strategy of aesthetics. Now, you know, this communication proceeds now into the next one, 
That, that is the strategy of rhetoric. By the way, all these communicative forms are, of course, intersecting. So that is an abstract scheme. Uh, the strategy of rhetoric is a way of addressing historical knowledge in historiographical form to the people. I said it already. And here, communication follows different rules. And uh, I give you two examples at the same time. Next picture. Snoopy has to give a speech, and you know, the first thing he says, <coughs> and um, I don't know whether this belongs to the strategy of aesthetics. I think it is a strategy of rhetoric. Next one, where you can see what it really means, that is reading history. I think uh, it doesn't need any words to make clear what this strategy of rhetoric is about. Now, the last discourse, the last communication we have to uh, take into account in order to understand the communicative dimension of historical sense, sense generation is a discourse of memory politics. That takes place in this basic, the practical life is taking place. And here, what is the place in this communi communicating identity politics and all the issues of understanding human life in an historical dimension? And of course, you know, here is the the force of power, of political power, absolutely dominant. What is the interference, the taking part of the specific historical sense generation called scientific? This is the last thing I see. I think I should uh, analyze because here, of course, is a place where everything about our business and our profession is decided upon. And in order to make clear what the issue is, I would like to present you another deep thinker of the 20th century. He's a great philosopher. His name is Charlie Brown. His friend says, I think it is wrong to be afraid, to be concerned about the day of tomorrow. Perhaps we should only think of today. No, said Charlie, this would mean resignation. And then he says, and that is the secret of historical sense generation, I still hope that yesterday will become better. You know what that did mean? I think we should take that very seriously. It is this sentence, I still hope that yesterday will become better, is one of the most remarkable statements about why we do history. No, it doesn't mean that historians change what has happened in the past, of course not. Then we would cheat the people, that would be Nietzsche. You just invent the story to please the people. Uh, this is, of course, not our business. The, to make the past better means to give it a meaning, to give it a sense which can bring about a change in the attitude of the people in the struggle for their identity. This is what I call practical reason. Yesterday, I tried to give you the example of what it means to make yesterday better. To put the past into an historical perspective within which the people of different cultures can communicate with each other in a way that they go beyond the clashes and the tensions of ethnocentrism. This is an example. And here, the main task of historiography, historical teaching and learning, 
is expressed. We have a chance as scholars following only the power of reasoning in theoretical and practical dimension, we have a chance to interfere in the struggle for power in the field of identity politics or memory politics to bring an element of reasoning into this struggle and that is a chance to break the power of power games, ethnocentrism, in favor of a little bit more humaneness or humanity in the, to the historical culture of our time. The time is running out, but nevertheless I think I should end with a kind of an appendix. The issue is constructivism. Constructivism in meta-history. And what I would like to present you is a critique of constructivism. And let me start uh, with the first um, step of argumentation, namely that constructivism has a point. Let's look at different levels of the practice of sense generation. And here you can see the level, I call it, of theoretical reflection. The past as past is not history. It becomes history afterwards. And that is what the historians bring about. Not only the historians, but the historians do it. They construct it with concepts and with the work in the archives, with methodical research and their historiography. Everything okay. So, why criticizing it? Because the constructivists say, and that is it. You should know about construction and then you know what you are doing and what you have to do. And then I say, stop people. This is only half of the truth. You overlook the other half. So in this scheme, I try to make it clear what construction means. We people of the present are combined with the people of the past by a chain of generations. And it's a very long chain of generations. It, go, it goes till uh, East Africa and this, uh, this human or not pre-human being, Luzi, you know, uh, you can see her uh, because they digged out some little bones and reconstructed a whole human feature out of it. And here you can, I, I indicated it, it is a relationship from the present to the past through the channel of subjective history. This is construction. This chain of generations is a very important argument. If we follow it, we will find out that all humans are relatives. And we should not forget it. Um, but my point now is that this concept of construction is one-sided if we want to know what historical sense generation is about. So let's look at another level of the same practice of historical sense generation, next picture. And that is a level of practical life. And here I would like to say, and here the constructors themselves were constructed. What does it mean? You don't make sense of the experience of the past out of zero. You do it in a context, you do it under conditions and presuppositions, which gives you a kind of a pre-structure of your construction. And here, the past is present. That is a result of the historical process ending in our present. 
Here is a past determining, or at least conditioning, not determining, conditioning the historians in their work of sense generation. And here the past is already there before the historians go into the archive. Here you can see it in a schematic way. You have the chain of generations. Now it is a kind of being determined or conditioned by the past. And the channel is from the past to the present. And I call that objective history. That means it is given, it is there in the reality of social life. And this is a secret behind the big issue now on presence in meta-history. That is Elko Rudia, Sepp Gumrecht, they make a lot of noise and argumentation about presence. That is the core of doing history. Yes, that is true, but in order to come to terms with the issue of historical sense generation, we have to let this presence pass away into the past. Otherwise, we can never fulfill our task of sense generation as I have it described, I try to describe it in the complexity of the schemes you could see here on the screen. And that is the end of my presentation. In meta-history, we have to try to synthesize these two levels. We, we synthesize it all, always when we do our work in historical sense generation, but we have to understand what this synthesis is about. That we construct, that we construct as being constructed. And let's think it together, and that will open up a new perspective of unsolved problems of meta-history. And that is the best way to end a paper by telling you, as my young colleagues, some are not so young, but nevertheless, there are still a lot of problems to be solved. So let's go on and work on solving these problems. Thank you very much. <laughs>